And help us to always keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, we pray for all of these names, all of these precious souls represented by their names on this piece of paper. And we pray for your graceful hand of healing in each one of them, whether it be counsel or travel or whether it be healing or surgery or recovery, recuperation or whatever it is, we pray for your hand to be mighty. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer, the privilege of your presence, that you always are with us, you never sleep or slumber, and you are eternal in every way and glorious in our lives. We praise you, and we thank you, Lord, as we pray the prayer which you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. All right. Glory to God. Let's, uh, let's uh, have our ushers come forward at this time, and we'll worship God with our morning tithes and offerings. So, if anybody feels the unction and
Fantastic. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I wanted to share with you something that I don't want to lose here. It's very important. It's about a little boy. This is where I'm breaking the law. What state was that, uh, Miss? Where'd Miss? Where'd Miss K go? Oh, West Virginia. West Virginia is Ill illegal for me to do what I'm about to do, but it's not <laughs> illegal in Tennessee. Uh, this is a story about a, a school teacher and a little boy. A little, little boy is asked, uh, well, one school teacher asked, what is your favorite animal? And uh, the person that's writing this said, I said, I said, fried chicken. She said, she said, I was very funny, but she couldn't, you couldn't have, uh, couldn't have been right. Everybody else in the class laughed. It, but uh, he said, it must have been funny because everybody laughed, but the teacher said that couldn't be right. My parents told me always to be truthful and honest, and I am. Fried chicken is my favorite animal. I told my dad what happened, and he said my teacher was probably a member of the PETA. He said they love animals very much, and, and I do too, especially chicken and pork and beef. <laughs> anyway, my teacher sent me to the principal's office, and I told him what happened, and he just laughed too. Then he told me not to do it again. The next day in class, my teacher asked what my favorite uh, live animal was, and I told her it was chicken. She asked me why, just like she had before with the other children, so I, I told her, because you can make them into fried chicken. <laughs> she sent me back to principal's office again. He laughed and just told me not, not to do it again. I don't understand. My parents taught me to be honest, but my teacher doesn't like it when I am. Today, my teacher asked us to tell her what famous person I admire the most. And I told her, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Guess where I am? <laughs> so, he spent a lot of time in the principal's office. Fried chicken. Well, we've got a funny story there, but we got a, a sermon that I hadn't found any places in the sermon to be funny, but it's, it's, a, it's a sermon that has opened my eyes to the grace and love and mercy and, and the, the hand of God mightily moving uh, in Paul's life. And he explains that so well in this beautiful section of Scripture. Uh, it's a story about God's amazing grace to take even someone who is locked into the way of the world and the way of religion and the way of the Pharisees as much as Paul, as Saul was. He acted in ignorance and unbelief and opened it, and, and Jesus opened his eyes to the living truth, the living way of the Lord Jesus Christ in the most beautiful way. It's a story about God's mercy, overcoming the brutality of Saul, who thought he was protecting God's way by doing what he was doing, but actually he was fighting directly against Jesus. Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus, you remember, Paul, why are you uh, tormenting? Why are you uh, persecuting me? Saul was doing the wrong thing for the right reason. He was doing the wrong thing because he was hurting people. He was doing the right reason because he genuinely felt like he was serving God. Those two don't work together so often. Mercy, grace, faith, love, and forgiveness, God's heart for each one of us are the things that were poured out into Paul's life. He called us to turn to Jesus. His abundant resources are limitless and free to those who turn to him in faith. He has abundant, limitless resources for you. It's like a little bird walking up to the Amazon River where Jill is and saying, oh, I better not drink too much so there'll be some for the other birds to drink. It's silly. That's a silly thought. There's an abundant resource that all the birds in the world could never dry, run dry. So we're looking at this section of Scripture today, and I just want to, I really want to focus in on one thing because it opens up the rest of the, the thing, the, the understanding for us. Uh, Paul, in, in 
uh, has said in this that I was a, a blasphemer. I read it, read it early. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. Uh, and, and he says also over in, in 2 Corinthians 7, here's a, a scripture, verse 2, make room for your hearts. Make room for us in your hearts, Paul said. I, we have wronged no one. We have, corrupted, we have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says we've, we've wronged or corrupted or exploited no one. And yet, in 1 Timothy, he says, I was a blasphemer, a violent aggressor, and a persecutor. Those two things are hard to recon reconcile. How do you reconcile? In one place, he says, I, was, I, was, I have wronged no one. I've hurt no one. I've been, uh, hurt no one, and then on the other hand, he says, I was a violent aggressor, persecutor, and uh, a tormentor of people. Well, there's a way that, un that you understand that, and it's the same way that you understand the things about yourself. Uh, we have to ask, uh, you've wronged no one, Paul? Well, what about Stephen, a young man named Saul, who, uh, a young man named Saul, early Paul, holding the clothes of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, as they stoned him to death? Saul was in agreement, hearty agreement, with putting him to death. What about that if you've not uh, blasphemed? Or what about, what about uh, when you say you've not, I'm not corrupt, you've not corrupted anyone? What about destroying families in Acts chapter 8? Saul began ravaging the church, entering from house to house, dragging off men and women. He would, he would throw them in jail and... Uh, what about, what about exploiting no one? Uh, what about in Acts chapter 9 when meanwhile Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples? He went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, which uh, Christians were called the people of the way before they were called Christians, if you find anybody that belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might be taken and bound as a prisoner to Jerusalem. So there were these contrasts, this, there were these this, uh, serious contrasts between what Paul was and put, between what Paul is today. Timothy 1.13, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. It sounds like Paul was wrongly, uh, was wronged. Uh, it sounds like Paul, as Saul, wronged and corrupted and exploited people. And how could he say that he'd not done those things? Well, you'll remember Paul's episode in meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. You'll remember that as he was going to Damascus with letters to arrest people, that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And a great uh, experience Paul had, it knocked him to his ground, the ground, and uh, it, it blinded him. And, and, the, and the voice uh, said, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Lord, Lord, how am I persecuting you? He said, it's difficult for you to kick against the goads. You're hurting my people, the things that you're doing. And Paul said, Lord, what should I do? What am I supposed to do? And he said, you're supposed to go into Damascus, and I'll, there'll be people there who can explain to you what you need to do next. And when Paul got up off the ground, he was blind. He couldn't see. And so they took him by the hand and they led him to Damascus. And they took him to the house of a man named Judas. And he was at Judas' house. And the Holy Spirit brought a vision to a man named Ananias. And Ananias, uh, the Holy Spirit said to Ananias, Ananias, I want you to go down to Straight Street to the house of Judas. And at the house of Judas, there's a man there named Saul. And I want you to go in and pray for him that he might get his vision back, that he might be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that he might be saved as a believer. First saved as a believer and then filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias rebelled against that. Ananias was distressed about what he just heard because he knew that this man had caused much struggle and much pain in the body of Christ. He said, I've heard many reports about this man, Ananias said, and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with the authorities to, and from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But Lord, the Lord said to him, go to this man. He's in my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to people of Israel. I will show him how much he has to suffer for my sake. 
And so Ananias went to the house of Saul on Straight Street. And he came in and he said, Brother Saul, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you and that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. Now, people in the New Testament are not baptized unless they're saved first. So when he was baptized, we know that he had been saved. He would received Christ. And he got baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And in a, a couple of verses later, it says, Saul continued to grow more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was Messiah. Praise God. Paul was saved and radically blessed and filled with the Holy Spirit and now becomes a, becomes a powerful witness for Jesus Christ wherever he goes. Unless you and I receive the new birth, we won't have the connection with God that we need to have in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit or to do his work at all. So we need to be careful about that. Reassess your life and look closely at, at how, you, how you live and what's gone on in your life in the past. But I want to connect the first things that Paul said about being a violent aggressor and the second thing he said now about blessing people and that he hadn't hurt anybody. The Corinthians had heard Paul when his name was Saul back before. But Paul speaks to them now from a changed life and a redeemed person and an infilling of the Spirit of God led by the Spirit of God, not from the person that he had been before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Does that make sense? Paul is now speaking to them from the new Paul and not from the old Saul. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, So now, Paul is writing, So now we regard no one from a, point, an, a worldly point of view. For though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so now no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that means uh, saved, filled, uh, born again, and, and, and having experienced the new birth and the changed life and what it does radically transforms our lives. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciles to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You have, a, as, a, as a believer... You have the ministry of reconciliation, calling out to other people to be reconciled to Christ. The ministry of reconciliation, it goes on, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him, in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And I've shared the prepositional phrase with you about in him for several years now. But the word in him means that we are we have been saved, we've been born again, we've had the new birth happen in us, and we're, we're different because of that. So in him, we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, not in him means we do not have the righteousness of Christ within us. Paul is saying this, I'm not the person I used to be. I'm a new creation in Christ. The person I used to be did, did those things to the people the blasphemous, the persecutors, the violent, aggressive stuff, thinking that I was serving God with true zeal and truth, not believing in Jesus. But I met him on the way to Damascus and, and believed in him and believed that he died on the cross for me and, and his resurrection really happened and, and Pentecost is here. And for a sinner like me, the, the worst sinner in all the world, he did that. And I found mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief when I was doing those things. And I was shown mercy, something which I never showed others before. Probably I said that. 
Now let's listen back once again to where some of the church in Ephesus was and where Paul may have been before he received Christ, but what Timothy was having to deal with and why Paul later wrote the letter to set first Timothy. The people in, in, in uh, Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, were uh, lawless, insubordinate, unholy, sinners, unholy and profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers and fornicators and all kinds of terrible things like that. And Paul is writing to Timothy to learn how and help him learn how to be the pastor as a young pastor of this church in Ephesus. And he writes to him uh, over in chapter 1, verse 5, Now the purpose of our command is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Love is the goal that we spread out to all people from a pure heart. That means in your heart, you're not trying to pull one over on God. That you really are sincerely with all your heart surrendered to the Lord. And in your work with others, you're really serious or concerned about the ministry that he's called you to do and the, and the work that he might be calling you to do. And when you, when you encounter something for Jesus that you sense he wants you to do, you, you do that with a pure heart, not as a hypocrite or not as a trying to fool someone. But we have love from a pure heart, love from a good conscience. A good conscience means we've confessed our sins and, and our conscience doesn't have to bother us anymore. It doesn't, your conscience is a blessed thing because it helps us see where there's, there's wrong in our lives, if there's sin in our lives. God uses our conscience to reveal those things. So from a, a, a good conscience means, means we've dealt with our sins and from a sincere faith. He wants us to be sincere and, and truthful and honest in our faith. We really do love God. I need, to, I need for you to know when you talk to me, you're talking to somebody that really does love the Lord. I need to know that about you. I, I want to trust that about you. When I'm talking to you, if you're a believer, I, want to tr I trust that you really are serious about your walk with God. You have a sincere faith. That's holy stuff. And Paul says this is what the command of God is based on. Love from a pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. So he says that the, the second part, uh, the last part of this uh, psalm, I mean the uh, word in 1 Timothy 1, that in verse 15 it's a faithful, it's a faithful saying uh, worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. However, I, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me, in me, Paul says, the worst sinner, in me the first Jesus Christ that, that first he might show all long suffering as a partner or as, a, that word is hyphenated in my Bible and I can't say it all together, a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Let me read it again. However, for this reason, since I'm the chiefest of sinners and I've come to Christ, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul is saying, look, if Jesus saved me, the worst sinner that can ever be, then certainly he can save you because you're not as bad as I was. You may be bad. You may be a humdinger. <laughs> but you're not as bad as Paul said he was. If he can save Paul, if he can get, make Paul into somebody that's written two-thirds of the New Testament and, and started hundreds of churches across across the Holy Land area and in Europe and in Rome, then surely you, you should be able to say that he could save you. Not as bad a sinner as Paul. Wonderful person. God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. He said that before. Do you believe him when he says that about you? He loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Father, the Father does. And so Paul says, this is the good news. That God has come to save 
all sinners and all of us are sinners and I'm the worst one. He saved me so you're on the list. He can save you too. He is a pattern. He came to be that for us. Paul gives God glory, acknowledging his royalty as king, eternal, immortal, invisible, his nature, the only God, and deserves all honor and glory and praise should be worshipped before God. Our heart cry should be the last verse of this in verse 17. He said, now, for all of those who have believed on Jesus for eternal life in verse 16. He said, then he says, all of our heart cry to God must be now to the king, to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That needs to be our heart cry. That needs to be the, the excellent first exaltation of our desire to touch God's heart. God, God's call on you and God's call to all of us is not limited by our past mistakes and, and errors. God's grace is available to every person. He opens our eyes to truth if we will listen. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul is the worst one, so he can, therefore he can save you. Our response is verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, I surrender. We sing a song, I surrender all. The only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Is your spirit singing now unto the king eternal? Is this your heart for God? Is this what you sense? Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Is that your heart for God today? Oh, may it be. May it be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the ways that we say amen to that is through Holy Communion. And today is the first Sunday, which we always, or usually, we try to do communion on first Sundays. And uh, uh, since Eric is not here, I've asked Judy, Reverend Judy, if she would come and and help me with Holy Communion today. If you'll take your book, your hymnal, and turn to page 26, we'll do, we'll do this uh, as a church, a confession. And we'll just go through the first, we'll just go through page, the first, what's on page 26 as we have lately. You that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort. Draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, shall we pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time have most grievously committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life. To the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy great mercy has promised forgiveness of sin to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn to thee. Have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all of our sin. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Our, holy, our communion today, which we call Holy Communion because this is started by Jesus, and the word holy has to do with freedom from sin, cleanse of all sin. And so when we receive Holy Communion, we ask God's blessings and grace on it, 
and we, in effect, consecrate the elements. And so let's have a, a prayer over the elements. Heavenly Father, we, we lift up these elements to you, bread and, and juice. We recognize the symbolism of the bread being your body, the, the juice being your blood, as you said so, many, so, so long ago, 2,000 years ago, but has been with us in the Passover meal since the days of Moses. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you for blessing these elements, cleansing them and making them be for us exactly what you intended for them to be, the symbol of your sacrifice, the symbol of our freedom from sin, and the symbol of everlasting life in you. We receive now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.
I want to thank Judy for, Reverend Judy, for helping us today. What a blessing. Thank you. Yep. We're going to sing a final hymn now, and uh, we're going to be blessed as, as we sing In the Garden. How many of you love that song, In the Garden? Yeah, that goes way back, doesn't it? And uh, what a joy. Yeah. All, your, all your life, Greg. Me too. Me too. Let's stand and worship. Page 314 in your hymnal if you need that. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the Father, in your great name, Lord Jesus, in your name, and Holy Spirit, in your name, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for what you have done in our lives, even as you have done in Paul's life. Changed him from Saul to Paul, changed him from a, a sinful man who was a Pharisee to a man who obeyed you and served you unto death. Lord, help us be so faithful and help us be so committed and help us be available to you that you may work your work in us whenever you call. 
Help us always to say, yes, Lord, I'm available, and I love you. Thank you for this day. Bless your church wherever we worship around the world. In Jesus' great name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.